Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 373, I chat with mastering engineer Eric Boulanger about his work at his audio mastering facility, The Bakery. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded September 28th, 2017, episode 373 Audio Mastering at the Bakery. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of AVSForum.com. This week's guest geek is Eric Boulanger, the mastering engineer and founder of The Bakery, an audio mastering facility on the lot of Sony Pictures. Hey, Eric, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be a geek. <laughs> you are my guest geek and a, and a proud geek, I hope, as well as I am. Yeah. Uh, those who are tuned in live at live.twit.tv can join the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv. And you can post questions as we go, and I'll pass along as many as I can. It always helps if you put my screen name somewhere in the message, Scott Wilkinson, no dots or dashes. Uh, that way it shows up in a different color on my screen, and I can more easily find it. So, Eric, how did you become a mastering engineer? Well, I guess the uh, long story short was I... I've been a violinist my whole life. My parents, for whatever reason, put the violin in my hands when I was three <laughs> and uh, never really got a good explanation out of them. I think they probably saw an ad in a newspaper and decided, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> and so I've been a, ever since, uh, you know, I still play professionally. I play for film and TV soundtracks and whatnot. And uh, so I've been a musician my entire life, was always studying. And uh, then come college age, I kind of had a change of heart from not wanting to do conservatory anymore. And, uh, and I figured that I would go to a university. I'd, I'd apply for a university, uh, so that I, I could do music and something else. And as at an early age, kind of like high school age and everything, I, I was getting bitten by the tech bug and, and the recording bug, but, um, you know, it wasn't until university where um, they had a recording studio. And by, mm -hmm. by today's standards, it's quite a small, quaint recording <laughs> studio. But, yeah, uh, I remember the one in my us. college as well, yeah. Exactly. But when, when I walked in there, I was just like, yep, this is me. This is what I want to do. So um, being as though there was no music production program or something that would be highly specialized towards, you know, what we do here in the studio, um, I decided, well, I already know the music side. I might as well study electrical engineering. And uh, so I went in, got in as a violinist, left as an ECE major. And yeah, um, yeah very random, but I was a straight C student and don't care because unlike my roommates who are working for like Lockheed Martin and whatnot, uh, I, I was going to Capitol Records. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Where they so probably first, didn't care too much about your grades, but more, can you can you deliver the goods? Yeah, and literally at that age as an intern, delivering the goods is, you know, the pizza that came in or <laughs> the coffee, more more specifically. So, right, yeah, having right. an advanced degree really doesn't, doesn't serve much purpose in that regard. But, mm -hmm. uh, Capital Studios was my first professional experience where I was actually their first ever intern. Um, it's kind of unbelievable that that's the case. But um, of course, the record label um, upstairs always had interns, but um, the studios never did. And who knows why? It doesn't matter. But somehow um, I talked it into my first boss, Paula Salvatore, and, uh, and she <laughs> let me intern there. And through that, that's how I got to mentor with Al Schmidt and pretty much, you know, learn everything and uh, oh, get yeah. started. You'd, you'd have you would learn some serious stuff from Al Schmidt. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. In fact, you know, it, it, it was funny. I uh, 
only recently even would tell him what my my personal game was but you know we were always in charge of the setup of of the studio the for the sessions that were rolling in and al records there so much that his his setup is well known by anyone who works there and uh so the little game i would always play with myself is to set everything up and as the musicians come in try to quickly make small adjustments and then watch as Al would come in and see which mics he would <laughs> readjust. And there was one session where he didn't readjust anything. And I was like, aha, got him. <laughs> <laughs> you got him. <laughs> so, or what you, what you had done, you know, he decided, yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the games you get to play as an intern. You know, you, <laughs> you, uh, you're there to learn and you're there to shut up. So... <laughs> Yeah, right. I wasn't, I wasn't about to quiz him on my performance, but uh, I could definitely right. stand back and see what he changes. So that was that was always really fun. Mm -hmm. And so when I permanently moved out to L.A., um, of course, you know, I needed to put food on the table. And uh, it so happened that Doug Sex was looking for a new engineer. And uh, so Al was the, the conduit of that. And... So to answer your question on how I got into mastering, because I always thought I was getting into recording or mixing or something like that. The way I got into mastering was Al Schmidt told me to go interview with Doug Sachs. And when that happens, you get in the car and don't ask questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Doug Sachs, of course, is one of one of the preeminent mastering engineers ever. Uh, yeah. He has since passed away, I believe. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but well, man, you, you sat at the feet of the master for sure. Oh, absolutely. Well, not only preeminent, but I would, you know, point out pioneering too, because he legitimately invented what we now know as mastering. He was the first independent mastering uh, engineer in studio. Um, and what we mean by independent is back in, you know, the 60s early 60s 50s it was always it was even termed transfer engineers not even mastering engineers because most records were done by the labels where they had their own studios they had their own engineers they had their own staff producers they did everything vertically integrated and the transfer engineer was just there to get it onto vinyl and um you know Doug was working with Lincoln Mayorga at the time, and they did their own recordings. And it was the first time that they did direct-to-disc recordings. And both of them heard what they had recorded, and they're like, this sounds nothing like what we pick up in stores. What's going wrong? And they realized that there really is a lot more in getting things onto a disc than what the industry had been doing. And they decided there was a business there, and opened up shop and mm. sure enough uh you know producers and artists started finding about out about that and hearing the sound and then forcing their labels to go there and then it took off and so that's you know mm -hmm. that's his contribution in literally inventing what we know now as mastering so what what is what are some of the things that he discovered or developed that needed to be done in order to improve how the recording got into the final distribution format. Well, the, that's that's the beauty of it. Um, and a lot of what we do with mastering too, which is there was nothing invented. It's not like you were inventing the flux capacitor or something. You know? <laughs> it yeah, was okay. only process. He, he was bringing about the process of, uh -huh. of mastering for the first time. And so... It's all the same equipment, but in making this a step and how we master the philosophy of it, how to listen, and the detail that's involved with all of it, you know, that detail goes into, of course, all the equipment and, and um, you know, what you're doing to make sure that there's as much resolution as possible. So really, in this new form of mastering, and independent nature from like you know the old factory system of labels 
uh, it's just really pouring so much more detail and attention into every step along the way of what has to happen to get that record on a store shelf. Mm -hmm. So I imagine the process includes things like uh, EQ, perhaps re-EQing -re some things or uh, sure. dynamically compressing things. What, what, are, what are elements of that process? Well, um, the basics of it, um, you know, Doug was always king of if it needs nothing, do nothing. Mm, which is good philosophy. I agree. Oh, absolutely. Which still applies to today. And, you know, it, it's really fun getting the opportunity for me to speak to classes or students. And uh, it's funny because like, I'll always preach the same thing, you know, if it needs nothing, do nothing, which is very difficult for even professional engineers, because it's like, they feel like they have to do something since you're charging. <laughs> all the money. Um, and then I find it funny when I say this to students, because it's like, well, the one thing we at least get to benefit from is we have the the best of mixers and producers and artists walking in the store. So the likelihood that it needs nothing is rather high. And, mm. you know, thinking back to my college days, if I were doing the same tasks, the likelihood of it needing nothing is 0%. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's definitely... A different circumstance so we have to take that with a grain of salt but uh you know his philosophy was always that so at least in those days when everything was analog so the mixes are coming in on a mix down like an analog tape going straight to the lathe um you know the best case scenario is where it needs no eq or compression or anything like that just let's set the cutting level the tape's all sequenced and edited together. You might have fades, which, mind you, on in those days, all of this you had to do manually and on the fly. And um, so, like like fade outs, for example, at the end yeah, of the song, exactly. it didn't have a definite ending. Yeah, well, many times a lot of fades, um, it's just elected that uh, masterings to do it, and that's usually uh. because. At the mix stage or after they've mixed down a song, you know, there's a lot of songs where the band's just riffing and going along or whatever, and they just haven't decided if they want to have the ending or not yet. So um, they leave it for the last second where obviously we can do it too. Um, mm -hmm. There's also other considerations with how you hit tape or if you're using noise reduction or something like that. Of course, if you were to do the fade out on the console in the mix stage, you're going to end up with more noise in that fade out than if we do it live on the console here, where then the only noise that's going into the system is the actual lathe itself. But um, so that could be an engineering decision between the mixer and the mastering engineer. But um, oftentimes it just randomly turns out that uh, we would be doing the fade. So that would have to be done on the fly as you're cutting the disc. So that's that's one facet that always made cutting in those days very difficult was because it really was almost like a performance every time you had to cut something. Um, right. So, you know, the the if it needs nothing, do nothing aspect is you pay a lot of attention to your tape machine, your tape heads, your selection, your preamp for the tape machine, how good everything sounds, and then use the shortest piece of wire to get it into the lathe. And then, of course, your electronics and sonics of the lathe and whatnot, and carry on. If it yeah. needs EQ, then you pop it in and you EQ it. If it needs compression, then you can do it. But those are all just artistic questions. But mm -hmm. the base of everything is how do I go from one format to another? Um, as resolute as possible. Right, right. One of the issues that I think really pertains most to mastering engineers than than others, mixers or recording engineers, is what we often call the loudness wars. Sure. Uh, can you uh, explain what that is and what your philosophy about it is? Well, war is probably the worst way of explaining, <laughs> explaining this. 
Um, all right, but that's the common term, like, isn't it? I mean, you know, well, it's definitely the term, and we all know what we're talking about with that. You know, the the propensity for everything over the years to get louder and louder and louder, and of course, technology completely plays into that. Um, you know, you didn't have excellent digital limiters like we do today back in the '50s, and hence, nothing was really loud. Um, so, you know, the loudness wars. The reason why war is kind of a bad ideal is because it's more like a plague. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, let's call them the loudness plague then. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and it's focused on the the loudness wars or plague, whatever you want to call it, is focused on the production end. You know, everybody loves to to moan and groan about oh this mastering engineer is always so damn loud and this producer like cuts loud records and blah, 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 blah. And it always is focused on the production end. And yet the reason why it's a plague is it's not like this is some conspiracy where we all get together and we're like, Hey, let's <laughs> mess the up secret the secret layer and take away all dynamics from anything that we release, you know, like that's not it. You right. know, also I don't make my business on like, I guarantee you my phone does not ring and say, hey, Eric, you make the loudest records. I want to book you. <laughs> like, <laughs> that also okay, never good. happens. So, you know, the reason why it's a plague is because, well, A, of course, we're doing it and we feel pressure. Fine. That's what everyone understands. The second half is words cannot describe how many times. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. Like I should start just taking a tally. I the, what does get booked with me is I'll get the phone call. Hey, love your work on this. Blah blah blah. I've got this really dynamic record. I don't want it loud. I want it like really audiophile and blah blah blah. Great. We do it. We make a fantastic sounding record. What's the note? It always comes back 24 hours later from the artist. Man. I love the sound of this record. It's great. Can you just make it louder? And it's like, <laughs> that's when you want to shoot yourself in the face. It's like, okay, what am I not getting here? So right. the plague then extends, of course, to the artist where, you know, they're comparing right. themselves against everything else that's out there. Okay, mm -hmm. great. We get that. But now it's been such a plague that... uh well, let's talk about loudness normalization for, for a little bit, which I've done extensive work with. Um, and it's great. We're getting there, but there's many problems. Um, define define it, loudness normalization first. So loudness nor normalization would be like sound check with iTunes or replay gain, which I believe uh, Spotify uses. Um, they're, they're the... Uh, uh, things like BS 1770 or, you know, the ITU standards that broadcast uses um, their, their loudness models, everything that converts measurements into loudness units, full scale, LUFS, um, so that you have an, a sensibility of the perceived loudness of a track um, or performance, whatever you're doing. And um, the loudness normaliz normalization, the first problem with it is amongst all of these platforms, let's say iTunes, Spotify, Tidal, uh, you know, all of those platforms, there's no standard. They're all different. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, the most simplest place where we should start is just say, hey, let, the target's going to be minus 16, done. And there's no standard even between like, movies and music so there's a bit of a problem there because obviously as a mastering engineer if there was a magic genie who could come out of a lamp and the entire planet every single thing that plays any music suddenly will be target minus 16 lufs then as a mastering engineer of course what i'm going to do is i'm going to set up my monitoring chain to reflect 16 db of headroom and where I can make masters that hit that target exactly so that when you upload that master and it gets played by a consumer, there's no extra DSP, there's no extra, 
you know, trickery being done to attenuate that signal down to the target level. It's just perfect. It's how it's meant to be. That's the and, idea. And the diff and the different, uh, if you play different programs, uh, different songs, listen to different uh, radio stations or streaming services or whatever, they would all be at that same level. Exactly. Which that would be uh, the that'd be the goal. That would be the goal, and that's the idea. And you know, the the problems with how that's working right now is not only the fact that there's no no standard, but also um, the loudness profiles, uh, the algorithms that determine loudness. Of course, you know, the first example that everyone loves to use is like classical music. You know, if mm -hmm. you have if you have a Rolling Sto Stones album. You know, the, the level is pretty damn consistent from song to song to song. Mm. But what about Brahms second, where it blows up at the ends, but 99% of it, like 60 minutes of music is, you know, at triple piano. Um, right. You know, that's a very difficult question for for any of these algorithms to, to really judge. Um, so there's been plenty of work put into exactly that but that problem's always going to kind of exist uh, but that's well, neither here nor there the point <laughs> i was going to bring up uh with a lot of the work that i've done uh specifically with sound check and and uh when i was working with mastered for itunes um was to my surprise what i would do is and al schmidt's a perfect example i i was using some some of uh, the work that we had done at the mastering lab at the time um you know, you take a, a lush owl mix um, where you would think that loudness normalization would completely benefit that type of sound and music where it's a little laid back and now it doesn't have to compete against anything and it can be in all its glory. So I would take the original master, see how much attenuation needed to be done uh, by analyzing it. Um, and then I'd rerun the master so that it would hit that exact mark, not need any limiting or anything, and then I'd compare the two. Now, they're matched level, and I'm just comparing which sounds better. And to my absolute shock, the one that was made louder and pulled down, I kept on picking. Um, now, this wasn't always the case with other mixes and everything but like the one that i thought would benefit the most was wasn't even benefiting at all and then i realized of course you know it's not there for making it loud but the gentle amount of squeeze that doug had put on um really was working artistically with with the master and that's part of what everybody liked so um you know that doesn't mean that this process is impossible. What it means is the idea of compression or a little bit of limiting or something like that has to be rethought for if we ever got that genie to work his magic. Um, <laughs> you know, the idea of compression will have to be reworked a little bit, especially for tools where you can still artistically use that, but it's, it's, for the tonality as opposed to we need to make this louder. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of what I've worked on that that was really surprising and needs work. And then the last part that I think no one thinks about with loudness is, is the manufacturing, the hardware ends of consumer everything. I mean, not that I like this whatsoever, but if that genie were to work his magic, think about how many like of those Bluetooth speakers are out there where everyone's having their pool party. Mm. Now the signal's 16 dB down. Do you think those things stand a chance in hell of even being heard if yeah. this is implemented? Of course not. And it's because there's so many... Of course, it's usually the cheaper, the lower-end um, audio, so... You know, think what you want about this comment, but still, it's ubiquitous. There's so much hardware out there that's going to suffer from the facts that 
we'd have this lower signal now. And the funny part is that's why this is the loudness plague. The plague reached all the way up into the hardware designers table where they're expecting loud compressed music and they're like, well, we don't need to use very powerful amplifiers or anything and now we can put it into the battery and and have these small speakers that actually make a lot of noise. And so it's like the the hardware design of so much hardware that's out there for a consumer is even affected by the the loudness plague. I think I'll just mm-hmm. point this now. Thank you, Scott. Very good. Very good. You can you can uh, trademark that. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, just just one comment from the uh, chat room here at, at this point. User 4949 says, uh, worse in this loudness thing is The weekend." You know, this artist, The weekend And sure. his tune, The Hills. That song, when it gets to the hook, you can almost hear an auto gain control on it. Well, so, um, I'm going to have to take his word for, <laughs> for it. Since yeah, I, I, haven't, haven't, I haven't heard it either. I haven't heard it either. I haven't either. heard it, but... Um, you know, that sort of thing, too, is uh, is many, many people in production, whether it be a mastering engineer, a mixer, a producer, um, will put dynamics into songs. So, you know, when you hear something as abrupt like that, it was probably on purpose and meant to... Meant as an effect. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, yeah, but, uh, sort of like auto-tune. In some yeah, cases, exactly. when a singer will use heavy, heavy auto tune, you know, it, that's what it's it's meant to sound that way. It's kind of artificial. Yeah. Well, a lot of mixers too, um, you know, will use a lot of compression from a tonality standpoint in what they do, and in doing so, like if you want to think of your traditional like rock or pop song, where you have a verse and a chorus, if you lay on that thick compression, then the whole song is kind of at one dynamic level. So after the fact, right. they'll go in and do gain rides on the verses to take them down and make it more musical where, you know, the verse with just a singer and a piano and a guitar sound at one level. And then when the whole, you know, gospel choir comes in, it's like, it sounds louder because there's more elements. So yeah. Uh, yeah. that could be what's going on there. I can't, yeah, we we don't know for sure. No, for sure. A <laughs> uh, <laughs> couple other questions here. Rev Dan Oreo uh, asks if you know Bob Heil. He's a member of the Twit family here. Is he did a lot of live sound systems that uh, Doug Sachs mastered some albums for for some of those some of those groups. Oh, absolutely. Well, I know of him. I don't know him personally, but uh, mm-hmm. certainly know of his work. So, yeah, yeah, he's he's well. He's been on this show a couple times. And he has oh, cool. his own. Uh, he has his own uh, podcast on the same Twit network uh, about mm-hmm. ham radio. He's a big, serious ham radio guy. Oh wow, that's no uh, surprise either. <laughs> <laughs> really, a uh, beatmaster in the chat room is asking: Did the advent of DAWs, digital audio workstations, and virtual instruments uh, change the type of mastering duties that you do? Um, absolutely. Uh, y- you know. It's really fun when uh, people visit the studio or, you know, you meet someone at a bar and, oh, what do you do? I'm a mastering engineer. And then you have to explain what the heck that is. Um, And of course, you know, the textbook will tell you there's recording, mixing and mastering and Mm -hmm. that these duties are clearly defined. And if there's anything the DAWs have done is to blur those lines immensely where you know the duties of what used to be traditionally um a step now could be done anywhere and so really my duties as a mastering engineer really does change from project to project immensely and it it totally is just um because technology and daws have enabled that you know that would Mm -hmm. be very difficult to do on a tape machine with a 24 track and a mix down and everything you'd be spending forever. But, uh, mm-hmm. with DAWs, it makes life goes a lot quicker then. So, you know, you find yourself as a mastering engineer, giving notes to a producer about 
what guitar lick they're re-recording. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, okay, so the the lines get blurred. Lines are very blurred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlie X is asking, do you ever do half speed mastering? I do. Um, Tell us what that is and and what it's good for. Well, um, I don't know if I'm at a darn. This really hurts very much because I don't think I'm at liberty to discuss two projects that are <laughs> coming out, um, that are extremely exciting. Um, one's okay. Hence, a classical remastering. So I think you guys can all get what I'm talking about. One's a brand new album, and I absolutely can't say anything. Um, and it's definitely not classical. But both I did half speed because mm. of their dynamic range. And because it's very simple, like, you know. So I guess you play you play the track back at half speed and master yeah, that, well, right? Well, I'm sorry. We, we should elaborate, too. I just dove right into this question. When he says half speed mastering, he's talking about cutting lacquers only for vinyl. So, oh. um, of course, I wouldn't be mastering things over here and listening to music at half speed. I'd probably hang myself. But um, <laughs> no, no, this is strictly for cutting lacquers and making the, the master lacquer that goes to, uh, to electroplating and the pressing plant. Um, for vinyl, so for that, vinyl records is what we're talking about here. Exactly. Um, so the benefit of this is, is of course mainly because of the RAA curve, the pre-emphasis curve in a cutting amp. Um, you have, it's a pretty much 6 dB per octave curve the whole way. You're up 20 at 20K, you're down 20 at 20 hertz about. Um, so across the whole audio spectrum, you know, it's pretty much 40 dB of pre-emphasis, which is massive mm. and uh so when you do half speed mastering you play your content at half the speed and instead of going 33 and a third that you're playing you're going 16 and two thirds rpm so half the speed mm -hmm. and it takes you twice as long now to cut this uh, what ends up happening yeah is the whole frequency range the whole spectrum of what you're cutting now every frequency is divided in half so 2k becomes 1k 1k becomes 500 now one of the the downsides of half speed is 40 hertz becomes 20 and 20 becomes 10 and now you're working into um you know the frequency response of your cutter head we're down there it starts falling off very rapidly so for something extremely bass heavy, this might not be a good idea. But mm. the main thing is you get so much better high end response because all cutter heads kind of go crazy above 10K. Um, it's where their active feedback starts falling out. Um, and that has a lot of issues. It's where a lot of mechanical dampening and whatnot starts playing into effect. There's there's a whole slew of problems. So, you know, the fact that 20K now becomes 10K, you're you're out of that range. So you'll, you'll get a much more linear high end, which is something especially audiophiles really enjoy. Um, and But the main thing and the main reason why these two albums that... Oh, I wish I could tell you guys. <laughs> we'll, have <to> <laughs> we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll have you back when you can talk about it. Oh, yeah, definitely, because these two are very exciting. Um, the main reason for it is since you have this huge pre-emphasis curve, when you do everything half speed, you also half your power requirement of the cutting amp. So what does that mean? You can cut twice as loud, which is... Oh, really no, fun. back to the loudness plague. <laughs> yeah, the loudness plague, but this is vinyl, so louder is better because there really is no... <laughs> no stopping it. Like with half speed, the facts of the matter is I can cut unplayable records. Like uh, it, it's just down to the point where, you know, the lathe can outperform any pickup or turntable 
um, at those levels. But uh, so that's of course a consideration. But with with dynamic records and things that need to be cut loud, half speed is almost the only way because um, you don't blow up your cutter head or your amp. <laughs> <laughs> both worthy goals i would say <laughs> oh absolutely and i've done both so <laughs> it's really not right. fun no i'm sure not <laughs> it's very expensive well, listen, too uh i wanted to ask you uh about your current facility called the bakery mm -hmm. uh, which is on the lot of sony pictures uh, and right. uh so i wanted to ask you how this came to be how did you end up on the sony lot well, it's a total honor to be here. And I mean, the Thalberg building that we're located in is even a historic landmark. I mean, if these walls could talk, mm. well, it'd be very interesting and scary probably at the same time. But, <laughs> um, yeah, of course, this used to be the MGM lot. And how this all came to be was uh, my violin. Uh, since I still play professionally um, on soundtracks and whatnot, I used to record here all the time. Um, not, you know, even having an inkling of moving in here. And, uh, when I started thinking about, you know, opening up shop and wanting to lease space, the one thing I knew was I could never do the buy a house, build a studio in a garage thing. It's just not me. Like I would hang myself just from mm. not having social contact. So I knew I had to be somewhere creative and I had even spoken with, uh, you know, Jeff Greenberg over at the village. And because the village is exactly that concept, I mean, even in the name. And uh, yeah. it's an incredible facility. And, you know, it's a bunch of musicians and producers all in one spot. It's exactly what I would want. There's only one problem. It's like people have to drop dead before the, <laughs> their room is <laughs> You know, and, and Jeff, I think, yeah. has turned every closet into that in that place into a studio. So I've, there's I've been there. There's I no know space. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's literally just no space. Um, so that wouldn't have worked out, even though it would be a dream. And uh, never mind. I love all the guys over there. So um, I, I started thinking of everything. And, and Movie Lots was one of my first thoughts. Um, I was even thinking about museums like the Getty, you know, ah. I know it sounds crazy, but like the fact of the matter is there's a lot of administrative lease space spaces at uh, museums, mainly for artists and whatnot and uh, preservationists. And so, you know, I, I figured maybe I'd be able to convince someone into why not this, at least it would be creative. You know, that's just where my head was. But uh, nonetheless, the contact here was of course being a regular musician here i knew all the staff engineers um adam michelak and greg denon and it was through them that i got connected with the executives over here at sony and that's how this all turned out so mm. it was again boiled down to my violin <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a picture actually of the studio that i wanted to show people uh, cool. I think you're there now, but uh, here's a That's picture more of the actual exactly room. where I'm sitting. <laughs> oh, okay. Just looking the other way, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, this your your assistant is there too. Oh, also, yes. also yeah. really good mastering engineer, Jet uh, Gal I've forgotten her last name. She is literally named after Joan Jett. Her full name is Joanne Jet Galindo. <laughs> no kidding. Wow. I'm That's so cool. Yep, her parents are pretty That's damn so cool. cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, what are those speakers in the background? I have to ask you that. Uh, they're ATCs. So the the left and right, um, the bigger ones are ATC 150s, and and the center one is uh, ATC 50. Um, and I chose the 50 for the center speaker just because um, the physical size of the same speaker in that area was actually kind of messing with my left and right imaging. I mean, mm. and mind you, this is in Eric units, you know, Ben Lilly's a very close friend and, and you know, the main guy over there at ATC. And, uh, you know, he was helping me with getting everything started here in that, that sense. And uh, he was very surprised to hear um, my thoughts on the fact that the 150 was interfering there. And I was just like, Ben, don't 
don't listen to this too much. This is just, you know, <laughs> hearing flea farts here. So, uh, <laughs> and also I think that, uh, you know, my choice and location of the speakers too might be ever so much smaller than spec. Um, and they look a little closer together. And what about the fact that they're, you know, obscuring the screen? You don't, you use that screen or not? I don't even have a projector in here. I ah! be I'm telling myself I'm going to use the screen one day, but haven't done it yet. Obviously, visuals aren't very important in a mastering studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I got gotcha. you. Well, speaking of which, what about uh, mastering for movies? We've been talking about music recordings, and we're going to get back to that. But mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask you, you've done some uh, mastering. Was it for movies or was it for the soundtrack album? Well, I've done a lot of soundtrack. Um, and, you know, w when, when music from movies gets mastered, it's typically only for the soundtrack. Uh, you know, what gets released as just a music product. Um, and that's mm -hmm. mainly because what they do on the dub stage is almost a form of mastering in a way. Um, not that I'm usually very happy with <laughs> the turnout. <laughs> of that. That's a, that might be for a different show. All right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think you're probably hinting at La La Land, which was a, definitely mm -hmm. a different story of the, the musicals. Um, obviously there's a musical. lot of mastering to do there cause it is a musical. Well, yeah, exactly. When the music is kind of like the whole point of the movie that that's when right. they consider things a little bit differently. Right. So, right. Uh, that's, that's kind of a bad example, I suppose. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that was quite fun working on that and, uh, almost winning best picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I watched that. That was pretty amazing. Yeah. That was pretty amazing. <laughs> Uh, do you have, what about mastering in immersive audio like uh, at Dolby Atmos or DTSX? Well, of course, this is a new thing and it's very exciting. Um, we actually are doing that, and coincidentally, because of this arrangement of uh, you know when I started this room, uh, Sony Pictures also there's kind of um, almost an identical room right across the hallway from me, so. That wasn't being used either. Um, I'm in a hallway of screening rooms. There's still four more screening rooms surrounding us right now. This room um, here where you're in used to be a screening room as well, right? Exactly. That's why there's a screen that's not used. Mm. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah, but uh, these two are the smallest ones actually on the lot, so they were never used. Also, my room, uh, specifically the screen, is some weird size because it was meant for TV uh, mm. when they were like TV features to film as you can imagine with digital that went straight out the window very quickly so mm -hmm. um, that's why this room was just never used it was also only film projection but uh, same thing with the room across the way so they turned that around as well and they made it into um, an Atmos mixing room mainly for uh, home authoring so they'll do the big Atmos mix on the dub stage and then they'll take that Atmos over to this room and do all of the Blu-ray work um, and little tweaks and revisions to to the mix over there. So mm -hmm. we're actually working together on a few releases that are all done in Atmos because we can link the two rooms together. Um, it's very convenient being across the hall from mm. all the proper equipment. And uh, right. the idea here is something that's slowly catching on, and um, I'm pretty excited about it. I think it might just work, but uh, you know, the idea is for a lot of big artists with with um, on their release dates or the weekend of a release that you know in in big cities or throughout the country, there would be actual screenings of of whatever you would call it. Um, of playing the record in a theater that fans could go to. And, uh, you know, it's just a totally new way to experience an album now. And I'm excited about that. We'll see what happens. It's kind of the forefront of this idea. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions from the chat room. Uh, Superu is asking, do you have any favorite near field speakers? Um, yeah, 
the ATC 45s. They sound exactly like my room here. Um, a good friend of mine and someone who I work with a lot is, you know, the incredible Joe Zook. And he just recently, and by recently, I mean like two years ago now, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> recently finished his, uh, his new studio. He, he actually has a, bought a house catty cornered from his house and turned it into an entire studio. So wow. I keep in front of him that he can zip line to his work. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, nonetheless, he, he finished this gorgeous mix facility, uh, for himself. And, uh, that's when he switched over to the 45s and, you know, when he got them up and right, he asked me to come over and take a listen to everything we put up stuff that both of us worked on and I was like, well, it sounds exactly like my room. So, uh, yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Charlie X is asking, do you receive material mostly in analog tape or digital audio file form? Almost only I, at this point, I'd say 99.9999% of anything <laughs> comes in only digital now. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually am having a hard time thinking of the last analog tape that came in here. I mean, it's it's been steadily decreasing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, about, I'd say about six years ago, there was, there was a lot of tape work coming in and it was bloody horrific because <laughs> it was a bunch of like, you know, the gearheads or the hipsters who just were enamored over over tape and they were using like messed up machines that they bought on eBay that obviously don't work. They were using tape that was erased 40 times Ugh. and like there was nothing right about it. And you know, we'd always end up sending them packing and go home and be like, okay, just bring us the files because this is garbage. And mm -hmm. they wouldn't like to hear that, but you know, <laughs> I'm really glad that that hasn't happened anymore. But yeah, there's there's little tape being done. Yeah, I would think so. Actually, now I remember my last record. It was a Joe Purdy record. And that one was really fun. Um, but those guys really know what they're doing with tape. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a yeah, very there different are There are problem. those. Yeah. Certainly there are those who, who really like the sound of analog tape. Uh, and and use it just like there are a few movie directors now who still prefer shooting on film. Not many, but there are some, so it stays alive. They're all, all of this. They're all tools. Um, exactly. Exactly. If you don't know how to swing the hammer. It's useless. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'd love to talk a little bit about some of the music projects that you've worked on, not the current ones. Cause you can't talk about those or you'd have to kill us. Um, uh, but, that'd be pretty uh, difficult. I heard there's a lot of people on right now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It'd be difficult. So, well, let's go to uh, some of the ones that you have, in fact, worked on in the past. Um, for example, Green Day uh, is one that we have a an album, some album art of um, Revolution Radio. Nice album art. I was very interested in this Rufus R Rufus Wainwright uh, album. This was a fun. Um, that's pretty amazing. I actually went and listened to a little bit of it. It's um, sh Shakespeare sonnets being read or sung, and basically put to music. Uh, so, so it, that was kind of that was kind of cool. Precisely. I I think mostly they did um, they did both throughout it. There was the interludes, which were all spoken word by you know really famous actors or actresses, um, and uh, and then, you know, the true challenge of it uh, and what was so fun was uh, I remember when they came in, uh, the producer, Marius DeVries, he uh, had like the hard drive in his hand and he came over to my desk and he just dropped it on the desk and he looks at me and he's like, good effing luck. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the reason for that is, I mean, it's this album's borderline mental because it goes from um, straight up, you know, opera 
just like his prior album where he recorded. Um, it's, uh, oh God, I'm blanking where they recorded, but it was Deutsch Gramophone recording, you know, just stereo mic. I think it was like the BBC radio orchestra or something. Don't, don't quote me. I yeah. forget. You're, you're, you're sort of trying to remember and it might be that or it might not. That's fine. Yeah. And something uh, along those lines. Yeah, exactly. Big symphony orchestra, well known, typically a performance orchestra on a stage, two mics, opera singer. Um, it goes from that sound, the typical DG sound, all the way to like, there's like a thrashing rock song to Florence and the Machine pop sounds to typical Rufus ballad on the piano. So like, and they're all back to back too. So it was just like one right after the the next one is completely different from the one before. Yeah, it's like you almost wish we're happy to hear the uh, the spoken word aspects because it gave your ear a break in between like craziness. But um, mm -hmm. you know, so to go from one thing to another was a true challenge. Just you know, figuring out where everything should be situated um properly but um man it is an incredible album it's mm. uh really good uh two others i want to just highlight a little bit here one is a shameless plug from for a friend of mine uh jim <laughs> self who is who is a fabulous tuba player i mean he's an amazing tuba player he's done he's worked in la for many many decades he was the voice of the mothership in close encounters of the third kind you remember that Da, da, yeah. da, bah, bah. that's him <laughs> and uh you you mastered his latest album called yo <laughs> and uh it's it's a great great art great album art and it's a great album it's all uh latin latin jazz and yeah, what a wonderful fact, player huh? about the uh, album art um i i wish i knew his name but i know jim told me that uh the artist is the same from the simpsons so um mm. You, you might kind of notice the similarities even in, in this cover. So, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Anyway, I, I just wanted to point that out. You did the mastering on that. I'm sure it was a fairly easy job as things go. Um, yeah, it was less complicated, well recorded and everything and very fun. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I liked how different it was. And especially, you know, for me being a, a musician on soundtracks and everything i mean i know i'm a violinist so like strings and brass usually don't talk to each other but <laughs> <laughs> i certainly my, knew who my, jim was yeah <clears throat> oh yeah i'm sure you've you run across his name a lot yeah uh the and other one i wanted to i would like to hear a, a tale or two from is the diana crawl album oh yeah uh, which uh you you mentioned uh, maybe might have had a few more challenges oh um this was challenging on the vinyl side and uh i'm incredibly proud of this album and uh it was definitely bittersweet too because you know diana had a few records out before this um but this was the one that she went back to her old team of tommy lapuma producing and al schmidt engineering and i mean they just outdid themselves again and it started out already bittersweet because of course doug wasn't around anymore he that was the trio. And mm -hmm. so it was both bittersweet and, you know, the honor of my life to be chosen to master this, uh, by those guys. And, uh, you know, and very strange to come full circle too, you know, especially with Al working, working with Al so closely, um, after, you know, he was my first real teacher. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and so, now your peers, essentially. Yeah, it's it, it's strange, but there's something you can learn every day. There's no question there. Uh, um, my philosophy and, of life, no doubt about that. Yep. It's it's just totally an honor always getting to work with him. Um, and then shortly after this record, you know, was even more devastating when Tom Tommy passed away shortly after we worked on it. Um, so it was. Uh, Tommy is. Tommy Lapuma, the famous producer. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it was uh, it was difficult, but um, you know, I love this record. It sounds incredible too, um, mm -hmm. and uh, 
you know, the cha- going back to the challenge you were asking about, uh, specifically on the vinyl ends, it was uh, very challenging because of all the sibilance that was involved, of course. Um, meaning, Diana's, meaning high frequency S kind of sounds. Exactly. Yeah. Diana's um, style is, you know, a very close, intimate sound on the mic of which, you know, Al excels at that sound too. And so you have all vocal, very, very close and intimate and, and sibilance therefore is extremely easy to come by and (laughs) very strong. And uh, if, if you guys are familiar, there's one thing vinyl does not do which is anything remotely resembling <laughs> sibilance. <laughs> um, oh, it just causes huge distortion and breakup, and that's, it's just no bueno. So mm-hmm. um, especially considering that one of the songs that she sings on there is Sway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, oh, man, so how, every time that word comes up, it's like... <sighs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so the, the trick on that one was actually we... I went in between my actual master, the the high res master, um, which was you know straight off of Al's board, and then the stems, uh, meaning breaking up the vocal, the instrumental, and whatnot, so that I could treat all of those bad S's very aggressively on just the vocal track and not the whole thing. Mm. Um, and there's something like 500 edits throughout entire um, program because literally I'm editing in the uh, the stems that wouldn't sound quite as good into the real master just for that moment of time on an S and that, that'll that make you sweat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time. especially if you're working I on like think- Diana Krall's voice. Oh yeah. And I like to think that type of care is uh, definitely one thing to uh, separate the men from the boys. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we pulled it off. So and and the vinyl has been getting incredible reviews. So I'm really, really proud of uh, you know just the engineering as a whole. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to touch quickly upon uh, something you mentioned a little earlier. You said you worked on something called Mastered for iTunes. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first, uh, I think the first album that was released, quote unquote, mastered for iTunes was uh, Colby Kalia. Kalei, Colby Kalei. Kalei, sorry, sorry. Ah, I, I should have known. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Col- Colby Kalei, Colby Kalei. And there she is with you on the, on the uh, uh, cover of Mix Magazine. Yep. Uh, so uh, tell us well, a, just a bit about what, what is mastered for iTunes. Uh, Mastered for iTunes was quite a fun uh, little thing that I got thrown into. Um, And it was all because I'm originally from New Jersey and um, was aggravated by having to set up a phone call with an Apple executive. An Apple exec came out of nowhere and wanted to speak with me just because they had upped their quality to 256. They were very proud of it, but like it was at a time when when I guess all of us professionals were complaining about the sound of iTunes and they wanted to, I don't know, have a pat on the back or something and talk with people and try to yeah. get their pers- you know, perception back. And so randomly I get this call and it's like an assistant wanting to set up a phone call. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm around. Just, just call. Cool. And... They're like, no, how about next Thursday? It was like literally a week and a half later at 2.03 p.m. I was like, you can't be serious. And they're like, are you great? And I was just like, yeah, sure. And then I totally forget about it. And uh, the next week, you know, the front office, James James calls me. And he's like, you have a phone call from Apple. And I look down at my watch and it's 2.03. And I was like, well, you know, F me. Uh <laughs> pick up the phone, get this guy, he starts talking. And so, you know, I was aggravated by this, like, craziness of this stupid phone call. And he starts telling me about, like, the perception and blah, blah, blah. And I, and wanting to be a prof- 
professional format. I just cut him off. I was like, if you want to be a professional format, I want to know why what I send sounds nothing like what comes back off the store. Where is everything getting messed up? And why are we working with CD masters? And I just laid into him um, everything that was uh, just so obviously wrong about uh, the distribution system, which the main problem was we were still in the age of the CDs. So the only thing we were delivering to labels were DDPs or or PM CDs, which are literally burn CDRs of the album. Like it was meant everything. And I, that, I swear. It, it, they duplicated, they produce CDs copying yeah. that, that thing. Exactly. And I swear, I mean, there must have been interns at labels uploading, putting in CDs and uploading to iTunes. And that's what you, the catalog was being made out of. I was like, this is ludicrous. Um, you know, first of all, it should only be files that takes away all this problem of of conversion and whatnot. And then, you know, aside from that, even if you're making an encode, like a lossy format, it doesn't mean that you start with the crappiest sounding, you know, format that you can. Like, you can at least increase the bit depth and you're going to have more resolution for your encoder to work from. And so he, he agreed and was very strange on the phone. And he's like, okay, I'll have that for you tomorrow. And then the next day I get a call from the chief of core audio. And in my email is a white paper marked confidential. And it's literally everything that I asked for. Huh. And we start talking. The next day? The next day. And, huh. and we start talking and I start looking in the paper and we start geeking out because he realizes that I'm the only music engineer he's ever spoken to who actually understands like DSP. And we start talking and everything. And I, I was like, wait, who the hell was I talking to yesterday to have you calling me and to have a white paper already? And he's like, oh, he reports to Steve Jobs. I'm like, <laughs> right, got it. <laughs> so that's kind of the story of how this came about. And, um, Colby's record was the first since we we were happened to be working on it at the time, and uh, we we went from there. And it, it at at the time actually it took a few months before they even coined the phrase "mastered for iTunes." And I don't know if it still exists on iTunes. I would assume it does. But if you uh, if you go to it was her album "All of You." If you go to the actual album on iTunes in the description it's some like lame attempt to, of explaining that we did something different like and something specifically engineered for the sound of itunes or you know something along is, those lines it's yeah really yeah but really all it was was starting from a higher resolution master yeah. to encode yeah, it all, to mp3 or, or aac or whatever it, exactly and you know the main thing that i'm proud of with that is isn't necessarily what's on the iTunes store and what everyone's downloading. The thing I'm proud of is overnight doing this changed the distribu uh, distribution model of the entire record industry. After that day, every record label was asking for WAV files and for high-res files, and it opened the door for properly sending checksums WAV files to like HD tracks, and suddenly, you know, it it changed everything. Like when when we used to have to send masters to HD tracks, like the labels literally didn't know what to do. And after this, like the infrastructure now was there, and you know people actually got off their ass and did something about the fact that this is really the master format now. So mm. that's that was the cool thing about Mastered for iTunes that. Uh, um, happened very quickly, and of course, on the consumer end, you would never see. Right, except for maybe that little note in some of the tunes, some of the tracks on iTunes. Right, right. Well, well that, that brings the whole marketing thing, but that came yeah, after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that brings up the the whole issue of the importance of high res audio, which we've talked about on the show a number of times, and uh, uh, so obviously one of the key elements and imp important points of high-res audio is how you're delivering that audio to whoever's going to actually 
make the final distribution product, right? Right. Um, so to put it more specifically, like I guarantee you, if anyone goes to the AES this year, there's going to be some douchebag over there doing <laughs> some AB between like a CD and a high res file. And everybody loves to compare, here's the high res and here's the CD. And do you hear a difference? And of course, if you're working from the same source, you're going to need a room like mine. You know, you're not going to pull someone off the street with earbuds and be like, do you hear a difference and come up with any statistical value. Mm -hmm. And the point about all of this is anyone who's doing these tests completely misses the importance of high resolution, which is the difference between high res and lower resolutions is when you work with it from day one, when you're recording in high res, when you're mixing in high res, you're mastering in high res, especially now that so much of our work is being done in the box, you know, with without analog stuff. Like there's many times where I'm doing strictly digital mastering because on the product, it's just sounding better. Um, and so working in high resolution is incredibly important in that regard because it's not necessarily a ma matter of can you hear the difference between two converters or two file formats. It's the more resolution and the more information that your DSP and your plugins and your mixing inside of your your computer, even when it comes out onto the console, has to work with, it comes up with, guess what, a better sound. So the only true way that you'd ever be able to compare, let's say, 44.1 to the 192 is if you took a recording session and recorded it in 44 and 192 and then went through the entire mixing process and mastering process on both of them to compare. But the reason why it would never be fair and you never could set that up accurately is because, of course, the differences in the sound drive your decision making as you're mixing, heck, as you're recording. Th these are all artistic and subjective emotional reactions as you're working on it as an engineer. And so you're never going to do the same thing on either format because they do sound different. and when you're working on it that hard, they're going to not only sound different, but those slight differences in sound like build up very fast. Um, you know, mm, if, yeah. if you now have 128 multi-tracks and you have a very, you know, minuscule difference between 44 and 192 that's subjective if you're comparing one track, well, now multiply that little difference by 128. It's it becomes something significant. You'd have to be deaf not to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're All dealing right. with. And so the whole high res debate and whatnot really gets tiresome because it's the whole process that people have to think about. And so in specifically delivering that to listeners, of course, what we're doing now, there's plenty of like the Diana Crowell record, for instance. Um, everything was done in 192. Up until if you go on, let's say, iTunes or buy the CD. Of course, I made a 44.1 version. Um, also up for sale is the 192 version um, on HD tracks. Um, the uh, MQA version on Tidal was made from the 192. And then the vinyl was made from the 192, plus all that DSing and whatnot. But uh, that's the uh, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Do all those different versions sound significantly different to your ears? Um, I tried my best not to make them sound significantly different. Of course, you, you, your goal was to make them sound as close yeah. as the same as possible. And so, you know, the reason why they sound pretty damn similar is because I actually manipulated that. <laughs> but, <at> uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, the main thing here is... In a perfect world, we wouldn't have to deal with these other formats because we could just deliver to you guys what was making the record in the first place. And that's the true goal of high res right there. 
is delivering what what the what you heard yeah, in your well, you know, in your studio you, you, as closely as possible. On this record, you can buy it on HD tracks. You can get the 192, but like you know, imagine if we just had. It's just a matter of you skip a step. Like we don't have to make the 44 one. We don't have a a conversion factor if mm. everybody were to get to listen to the 192. In this right. case, right, right. Well, listen, uh, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour. I want to thank you so much for being here and uh, sharing your expertise and your experience and some great stories. Thanks so much for being here, Eric. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you to the questions, too. They were uh, really great. Yeah, they always are. I got a great chat room, I, I always say. Um, so that's Eric Boulanger. He is the mastering engineer founder of The Bakery Audio Mastering Studio in L.A., and you can find more about him and his work at thebakery.la. You can find me always at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at avsforum. And you can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg. And on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks next week my guest geek is scheduled to be don eckland he's an executive vp at sony pictures uh, in the same location where eric is uh, but he also works with the uhd alliance and he's going to bring along a couple of his colleagues from the U uhda to talk about uh, uhd blu-ray and the whole new video world that we are now in the process of entering so I do hope you will join us for that. Until then, geek out. Yeah.